economically and put ourselves back on track. I mean, there was a local business actually the other day, and it, it just kind of took um, took me aback because it was a restaurant tour actually, and I thought, oh my gosh, how could she possibly be closing? You know, my um, office for many years when I my startup was actually in Chesterfield, and I moved it out to St. Charles County two years ago. But I uh, was listening to her talking about having to close her restaurant, her second location down, due to just, I think, honestly, just being closed too long. Yeah. You know, closed down too long, and they're not being, you know, enough business or a way to, you know, PPP came in, and that could be another topic. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to get dry. Um, PPP came in, and for a lot of folks, it was just enough to pay those that were maybe, you know, 1099s mm-hmm. and not getting enough, you know, uh, unemployment or not getting unemployment at all and having to pay those folks. A lot of people took that to pay their employees to keep them afloat yeah. and help them keep their bills paid. Um, and to have to have to close a business down completely, it's not in my district, but that's not, you know, if she's closing, others are closing. Well, there's a lot of restaurants that are going to close. There's a lot of businesses that uh, are service type businesses that are going to close. Uh, retail outlets, mm-hmm. uh, are going to close. I mean, you know, sure, people are buying online, but they don't go to the stores. Um, Target and Walmart could open, but a clothing store could not, which was kind of strange, okay? Uh, This whole pandemic thing has been, in my opinion, managed horribly. Uh, In the Wall Street Journal this morning, I read statistics. I'm going to go off, I'm I'm, going to remember these. I have a snapshot in my head. But in, they talk about, oh, the, 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 the increase of cases have just gone through the roof. Mm-hmm. Okay, in May, we were testing 20,000 people a day. Now we're testing 60,000 people a day, mm-hmm. and we have more people testing positive. Shocking. Mm-hmm. Uh, less people are dying. Now, that's not to say this isn't a problem, but uh, Dr. Fauci, first he said you don't wear a mask. Then he said you do wear a mask. And then he said, well, we don't wear masks. So we said we don't wear masks because we didn't have enough. We wanted the healthcare workers to not be afraid to go to work. So you lied to them and had them threaten their lives just so you could meet your agenda. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm not an anti-Dr. Fauci guy. But the guy lied and raised his hand and said he admitted to it, okay? Uh, who do you believe? I, this whole thing is a total mess. Some people say you don't need to wear a mask at all because it's the it's the scandemic. Okay. Some people say uh, it's a Chinese plot to kill the world. Some people say uh, I heard Rush Limbaugh say this whole thing was created just to get Trump out of office. Now, I'm a big Rush Limbaugh fan, but holy mackerel, that's surely they didn't invent this thing just to get Trump out of office. Okay. But what is it? What what do we do? How take do we... My, my take on the pandemic? Yes, please. I was a man, that's okay. where I was going. COVID-19. You know, you're probably going to ask me about masks next. So I'll get you there. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you. I told you at the beginning, I think it's bio-warfare. I think Trump was enacting tariffs on China. And I think, you know, we are, we are by far owned by China here in the United States and people realize I and mean, if Walmart's not enough to wake you up when you go in and buy the next T-shirt and the label inside of it says made in China, are the mask, when we get to that, when you open the next box of mask, because we couldn't get for months, and you're taking the package apart to open and wear your mask, and where is it made? China. I think that it was a, it was a ploy to stop our economy, and like it did, we came to a dead halt. They knew we weren't ready for it. We've been sold out since NAFTA, since the Clinton administration. This has been moving. I've been watching this since I was 25 years old. And I can remember when that started. And I thought, hmm, little by little by little, we're going to be sold out. We've been sold out. Now we've elected Trump to take it back. And that's part of my claim. And you'll see on my tag when you see my political stuff or my campaign is reclaiming Missouri, reclaiming America. I am right there wholeheartedly behind the fact that this pandemic and this COVID-19 was a virus that was built in a lab and placed upon the rest of the world to stop us right in our tracks and let us know who was boss. Now, now I, I need to say something to my to my dear listeners because uh, they're going to roll their eyes and they're going to say, okay, here goes another strong guest with uh, uh, conspiracy theories. And I've had I've had UFO people on. I've had Bigfoot Great, people you on. Great, you know but, George Norrie then, do you? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, but but the thing is, is this, this is not conspiracy theory stuff. 
Uh, I've heard lots of people that are a whole lot smarter than me said, look, this thing wasn't started in a wet market. Because if it was started in a wet market, we'd have had A, B, C, and D. We had none of that. Now, I've heard nobody say this was something that was done on purpose and shipped to this country. I've heard people say that this was just a mess gone bad and they had to cover it up. To me, all that needs to be, forget about that. Take care of it. Find out what's good. Get rid of this thing, beat it, and then go back. And if that's what it was, I, I, know, I know you say that, that, that China owns us. I disagree uh, because if we stopped buying stuff from China, we'd have, a, okay, we'd have to get our T-shirts, T-shirts from Guatemala instead. We'd have to get our electronics from, from Taiwan and Singapore instead. But we feed China. They need us as much as we need them. Uh, we don't need them as much as you think we do. Uh, I think we do. Well, I don't think, no, I don't think we need them that much. I'm saying no. they, they need us just as much, if not more, than we need them. That's what I'm saying. Well, I remember when I bought product and I grew up and things were made here. I mean, to think that you would even eat in a Chinese restaurant was mm-hmm. like, it, there weren't that many on the corner where there were buffets everywhere. You know, it was like, I just, I'm thinking of, you know, good old fashioned Walmart Bentonville, Arkansas. I knew about Walmart because I told you my both my parents are from Arkansas before it ever right. hit the nation. Exactly. You know, I was back backwoods and up in the mountains shopping at Walmart and Piggly Wiggly. Um, I think for me too, and maybe um, what makes me, you know, when we talk about out of the box thinking or you know why I formed a think tank podcast. I have experienced some things in my life and done some things in my life and traveled to some places in the world that, for me, conceivably, it's possible. Um, I've walked past mounds of graves where they're unmarked from, you know, the annihilation of the Jewish community in Germany, you know, through World War II. I mean, I've seen things that people have never seen. I can remember an article or something, a post from Blaine Luchtenmeyer again, you know, when he was, he was honoring D-Day and talking about the history of D-Day. I'm like, uh, I've walked on the shores of Normandy. I've come in on a... On a you know, the Irish ferry from Ireland shipping a vehicle back and traveled across France for two days, dropping in and out of military uh, museums and in honor of, you know, World War II and that particular time in, in our history. And, you know, like I said, I've seen things. I've seen things that other people haven't seen. And, and it's not that it makes me very special. It's just, it's just the fact that I think that makes it um, easier for me to conceive certain things and think a certain way. I also think about, you know, um, I can remember the time where I was taking a criminal law class and I was sitting in a German military installation taking the course and little did I know that, you know, I'd have a little money to take a weekend trip to Paris with my husband at the time. And I said, you know, let's take this trip. It's educational. And we took off for the weekend. And next thing you know, I was just reading about the Code of Hammurabi and I'm standing right in front of it touching it. So, I mean, that's the law, the first laws of man and civilization. So, you know, without law, without order, we, we destroy ourselves. and I that's, guess what, that's what civilization is all about then. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to be a civilized society. Uh, we have to discuss, not tear down. Uh, and the, the more we talk, the more we're going to learn mm-hmm. and the more we're going to understand one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, this country is the greatest country in the world. And no, no, no other place comes, comes even close. Okay. Of course, I'm biased. I'm an American, but but we have freedoms here that other people just dream about. Uh, you talk to Brits who come over here; they they, they come over here for the opportunity because we right. this, over, over over there you're hamstringed if you're because of who your dad is. Okay. Well, and I can't tell you how many how many would love to meet an American soldier or so forth and marry them so they can come back. And become an American citizen. I mean, that's an experience in itself. Well, that's that's. Um, I mean, during after World War II, that's why uh, exactly. That, that's why the British men didn't like the GIs because they're 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 overpaid, they're oversexed, and they're over here, and they took our girls. Well, you're, you're right on. You went right there. I was taking you, but I mean, I I also look at you know the influx of you know when you when you look at refugees coming into the country, you look at the Cubans that come in. I mean, they'll come in from Central America and up through Laredo, Texas, and across the border. I mean. They would give their lives, you know, possibly, and some of them giving their lives mm-hmm. just at the trek to try to get here to the land of of, of plenty. Well, and, and you hear the distractors saying, well, we're not such a great country. Well, okay, here's what I'll say. 
They're not exactly busting down the door to get into Pakistan. Now, are they? No, they're not. Yeah. Speaking of Pakistan, I've, I've seen some of their artwork, too, in the Louvre. <laughs> but I, I really am grateful for all those opportunities I had, and I've, I've been blessed to have the, the, the opportunities that I've had and some of the experiences that I've had through my educational opportunities, and, and that was even done unconventionally as well. I mean, my degree program was I, – I took classes all over – a country that allowed for me to travel from here to there to wherever to get it. I mean, and it's really how bad do you want it, mm. you know? And I'm I'm moving through my my platform as we're talking. Well, as, as I'm as I'm hearing this, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna tag you with a label. I'm going to call you a Renaissance woman. Would that I like would, it. would that be an accurate statement? I'll I think it. it is. I mean, you've done a little bit of this and a whole lot of that. I like it. I'll take it. <laughs> now we've got to get me elected so I can be a Renaissance in Congress. Um. A very candid question, and it's not a loaded question. Do you think you have a chance? Oh, I think I'm. I think I'm the wild card. Really? I do. Based on what? Based tell, on what? Well, tell me why. My strategy, honestly, um, to enter the race was not to enter on the date that everybody was entering. Um, I had already given my resignation the first of March, and the the, the weeks um, preceding with the public knew what COVID-19 was going to be doing, because I was inside the, the the offices that actually were overseeing it. I literally placed myself at the bottom of the ballot, which is actually number five on the ballot if you're looking down at the bottom. I, I knew what my platform was going to be well before I decided to enter the race. And when I entered the race, I immediately started getting phone calls trying to disqualify me to get me out because I was a state government employee, and I had announced my candidacy while I was state employee. Well, guess what? No, I didn't. Um, I'm actually, I'm well-versed on on public legislation and state statutes. I'm having worked in state government off and on for 20 years. I also knew the policies um, upcoming and what the state statute was actually getting ready to change. You can't can't be a state employee and run for office? can now. Two months after I entered the race, Governor Parson signed a legislative... Every politician, every politician that goes for the next step up is a government employee and they're running for another office. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Well, you're a public servant. And now there actually there is state statute in place that now if you're state employed, you can run for public office. Okay. And that was just signed in, in last, this last May. Okay. So um, I, I feel like, you know, when you talk about Renaissance women and I, I look at uh, my candidacy and, and being a wild card, I, I, like I said, people were trying to push me out immediately. And I, I expect that there's going to be things, you know, if I have anything to hide, I wouldn't be doing this. I'm very, very public as it is anyway, um, my social media feed and my businesses and my nonprofits have been out there for quite some time. I think my track record proves itself. If you go back into my term with the Department of Economic Development and Workforce Development, a lot of those people that were out of work in 2008 and 2009 are on my LinkedIn profile. You know, I helped build their profiles, Mm -hmm. which is now a virtual resume, right? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I wholeheartedly feel like I have what it takes to go in. I feel like I am seasoned enough in life, and believe me, if I can serve as a military wife on foreign soil and not be intimidated by it and hit the ground running over there. I actually had a job two weeks after I arrived, and that was just unheard of. I had found a job to work. Really? <laughs> and then I was speaking the language. So, I mean, I just took – I wholeheartedly embraced it, and I truly, truly am a public servant. I was called to do this back when I changed my major, and I graduated in 1999, like I said, from Linwood. I changed my major from communications. Actually, I went to go into television and radio broadcasting. And I changed my major after serving seven years as a big sister for Big Brothers Big Sisters in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Um, I served on the same match for seven years. And it just changed my life. I knew that I was called to service. And I think uh, from the experiences that I've had from working in several different departments that I've worked with, I know what's going on. And I don't think anybody's really ever actually touched all of that. And little did I know, you know, that in 2020 I'd be dealing with, you know, public uh, or school security. So really, um, for me to see legislative change for that and use Missouri as a pilot for that is going to change a program or actually change legislation for the entire nation. So that our our children and your children, your children's grandchildren and whatever will go to school and go to school like we did to learn and not be worried about when the next intruder drill is going to be. Or when the next assembly is going to be in the gym, you know, they have on the fly or a surprise, and the parents don't know anything about it. I just feel like, you know, we've got somebody that's currently in office that's serving his sixth term. He'll be serving his seventh if we reelect him. He only won the primary in the last election by 95,000 votes. That's not that much. 
And I really don't believe either that your social media and your following and your likes really get you elected. Because if you take a look at his following, yeah, he's got about 11,000 followers on a social media feed that he... 